Hi everybody, I'm back, Dr. D. Bunk, and this is uh, part two of estrogen replacement therapy and why it's not connected to breast cancer and any other cancer. And so watch part one if you haven't, because then this will make sense. So I went over the whole controversy, why it's fiction, ridiculous, that there's no connection there are no studies that ever were done in a correct way to show a connection between taking estrogen in menopause and increasing your risk of breast cancer. You know, what they're studying is that, is that if you have cancer, getting rid of your estrogen, neutering you with estrogen uh, blocker drugs will give you a better chance of being cured of cancer. I don't know if I believe that's true. I'm going to do an exhaustive research uh, uh, of the literature to see if there's any evidence to support it. I have the feeling that there's probably not, that the studies weren't, aren't really there, but they just start, I won't even get into it. I've talked about how they stack studies, how they make studies to get the outcome they want. <clears throat> um, and so, so if you can accept that there is no connection with taking supplemental estrogen or any hormone and cancer, then if, ladies, you're having menopausal symptoms, it's because you're low on estrogen. So hot flashes, mood swings, uh, sweating up to bed at night, masculinization of your body, dry hair, dry skin, dry bed, vagina. It's like no sex drive because you're, forget it when, <clears throat> You really get low. Now, women go through a phase from the late 30s to the 40s where you still have enough estrogen, but it's dropping, and your testosterone levels then appear to be more dominant, and you can have a heightened sex drive. But in the end, you just won't care <clears throat> about sex at all. And so um, hormones, let me say it this way, hormone therapies are nothing but good. There is nothing but goodness in supplementing with hormones. Not too much. We're not talking about, you know, trying to have the estrogen, testosterone, thyroid, whatever, hormone levels that are stupid high. <clears throat> We're talking about, do we have the reasonable amount of information at this point in medicine, after using hormones for, what, 70 years? Do we have enough information to get an idea of what an optimal level of hormones should be for healthy people at all decades of life? And the answer is yes, we do. But it's an experience-based thing because they won't study it. There's no money to study, the to figure out. I mean, if I won the lottery, I would spend $20 million and I would come up with the first evidence-based study that could show what amount what levels of hormones in your blood with a particular lifestyle and a particular tissue level would be necessary to achieve optimal we could do it but nobody's going to pay for it it's not in the interest of people needing more drugs because the more hormones you have the healthier you're going to be and again not supercharged but see all these knucklehead weightlifters over the years who by the way are, are at least 50 percent right in what they were proposing. There's a lot of science now to support much of what they've said. Um, but they've driven this movie, but they also, you see the extremes of these weightlifters that look like Martians, and they end up dead when they're 40 or 50 or whatever. So that's given it a bad name. And then doctors scaring everybody, you know, and then the history of it. I mean, thyroid hormone, uh, the correct way to do thyroid hormone is not done by 98% of doctors. They have no idea how to do thyroid. These endocrinologists are worthless. And I'm not talking about for endocrinological diseases, but the average person who's deficient in thyroid goes to an endocrinologist, they'll just screw you up. That's what they're going to do to you. Because they think that the blood level means something, and it doesn't. So, to understand, say, for estrogen and hormones in general, there's two issues here that we have to start with. <clears throat> so let me get back on point, estrogen. 
But this is, these are the principles that govern all hormone therapies. Hormone replacement therapies are treatments for deficiencies, not disease. Doctors are licensed disease treaters. So our principles don't work. You have to learn a new way to do it. And the doctors that realize that what they're taught fails, learn, uh, start looking. And I started looking over 25 years ago. And then you start to see a new way to do it. And when you do it, everybody's great. Your patients. I mean, I have over 500 thyroid patients that see me twice a year for thyroid because nobody else will give it to them. But I live in a rural area. There's doctors who will do it. <clears throat> anyway, do it correctly. But so there's two issues. And, and that is with hormone replacement therapies. Um, and that is blood levels, what do they mean? And symptoms, what do they mean? In other words, how do you know you're low in a hormone? Well, people know because they have symptom changes. If you're low in estrogen, then women have the symptoms I've just mentioned. And so if you go to your doctor, he's going to do a blood test. But does the blood level correlate with the tissue level? Does the blood level of a hormone have anything to do with how much tissue levels of the hormone you have? And the answer is basically no. It doesn't correlate. And it's a long discussion on the physiology of hormones, and I'm not going to get into any of that. But by 2010, 15, the scientific evidence is so clear that the tissue level of a hormone has very little to do with the blood level unless the level is too high, unless you're supplementing. But low levels of hormones don't show up pretty much in blood tests. And I could explain all why. And the science to me is overwhelming. And so that means to treat somebody for a hormone deficiency, in this case, menopausal symptoms, you can't use a blood test. You have to diagnose symptoms and then treat them. But doctors don't want to do that because we don't want to talk to patients. So they're just going to do a blood level. And, and the longer a woman's in menopause, then the more the estrogen level will drop. But when I became a doctor in 85, do you know what the normal range for postmenopausal estrogen level was? Zero to 20. They believed back then that you could have no estrogen in your blood, which means how is any getting into your cells? That's not quite true. It still would get in there, but I'm not going to explain why that either. But um, And so that's crazy. Now, after doing this and after we've been doing this 70 years <clears throat> and blood tests came online in the 70s, when you treat long enough, you can start to see the relationship between blood levels and what levels of deficiency or normalcy or even optimal people have. <clears throat> and so you can learn by trial and error and experience how the blood level correlates with symptoms. And so now they've, the, I mean, now I think the range is 50 to 100. They keep making it higher, but now, you know, they're attacking estrogen, but still it's gone up. But what I experienced just to get to it is most women like to be from 100 to 300 on their blood level of estrogen once you're supplementing, which is fine. Now, is that more than a natural woman who's not taking estrogen? Yeah. But how does the natural woman feel? They don't feel so good. Now, are there exceptions? Absolutely. Again, because we've never correlated in medicine, blood levels and tissue levels with anybody, no studies, that we're not going to know until that gets done. And we're not going to know the variabilities here that we're not seeing. <clears throat> and so the first point is that you can take home. You can't let a doctor treat you or not treat you. Basically, diagnose you. Do not let a doctor diagnose you with normal blood, normal postmenopausal estrogen levels because he says your blood test is fine. It's symptom analysis. If you have the symptoms of low hormones, you should take them. If you have no energy, you're fat, you're tired in the afternoon, sometimes in the morning, you diet, it doesn't work, you don't have any energy to exercise, you're low in thyroid, which is half the country basically. But thyroid blood tests are the worst. You have to be extremely low or severely low in thyroid before your blood test even gets near the bottom end of normal. Why is everyone addicted to caffeine in America? because you're low in thyroid and thyroid's, uh, caffeine's fake thyroid. So, and I did a whole thyroid video, you can go look at that. <clears throat> but 
But on estrogen, <clears throat> there is a little better correlation there. But the problem is, you know, women like to be 150 to 250, sometimes more. I have some women, they're estrogen kitties. They're, they're like, they can't take enough. And the real kicker is, I have seen women with estrogen levels above 3,000. And that is 10 times the normal level of a 20-year-old. And you know how they felt? Great. No symptoms of anything bad. Zero. Now, of course, that's nuts that you would, you know, and I don't let them stay there. But I have women, they're like begging me. I have some women, they want horse estrogen. They don't like estradiol. They want horsey estrogen, which has never been shown to be bad, but it's just not a good idea because there's two types of estrogen and horse estrogen that aren't native to women, estradiol and estradiol. But the point is you have to treat, you have, you have to get a doctor that'll treat your symptoms. Now I have to interject here because I forgot to say it. This is for educational purposes. This is what I do with my patients as I'm legally licensed to do. You can't do this just because I'm saying it. You have to do your research and talk to your doctor because it's a prescription anyway. But this is what I have learned in the 25 years I've been aggressively treating hormone replacement therapies. And so if you have symptoms, you get treated. Now the question is then for treatment, well, how much do you take? That is where blood tests are helpful. So you learn after a while, doctors like me, I read the doctors that came before me who became before them. And, and since the 1980s, when we had a lot of blood test stuff, um, doctors that that treated the symptoms. So how much you take is enough to get to where you feel like you're optimal. So what are the optimal effects of an optimal level of estrogen in a postmenopausal female? And I won't get into all that, but basically you feel good. Your hair's not drying out. Your skin's not drying out. You know, um, your mood, that's a big one for women. The mood, women feel normally emotionally. Um, when their estrogen levels are good. And when they're not good, it's easy to tell when they're not good because women will basically say the universe is crooked. Mentally, nothing is right when you're low in estrogen. And so it's the absence of the crooked universe, which is my sarcasm, and I have a lot of that. But, and so, but then blood tests are important because it's easy to give people too much hormones. And that's one way they got a bad name in classical medicine because we didn't even have blood tests before the mid-70s. Well, we've been given thyroid since 1910. We, I think they get estrogen goes back to the late 50s, testosterone, late 50s. So um, there was a lot of problems by giving too much. So we have a great system now, and that is you give people hormones, and, and when they feel good, you can do blood levels to see that they're within reasonable ranges, you know, and then... You leave them there, and then you have to do periodic blood tests to make sure it's not creeping up. Because levels, especially estrogen, has notoriously can creep up over months and years. And so this system works the best. You don't initiate treatment or diagnose treatment based on blood levels. It's symptoms. And this is what doctors are not doing anymore because we're lazy and we just want to do it. look at a lab. And, you know, if we had a lab test that could identify green Martians, so the Martians have invaded, and they can look like humans. And if we had a blood test that could find a green Martian in disguise, and I did one on you, and if it was positive, I would say, the doctor would say, you're a green Martian. And they're like, no, I was born a human. It's madness how far we've gotten into whatever the test shows what you are. Anyway, um, hang on a second. I've got to sign something. And the phone's going off. I don't want to stop the video because it's this whole thing for me. Ah, shut up. This whole thing for me to start it over. And everyone knows how unprofessional I am. I'm not. What you see with me, looks, forget about looks, forget about. I am about outcomes. I don't care about looks or cosmetics or any of that. It's results, baby. That's it. Outcomes. I want to give you a higher standard of health, period. And, um, and if I come to work in shorts, cutoffs every day, I would, but I can't go that far. My wife would kill me. Anyway, but I am the sock doctor because I always take off my shoes in the summer and the afternoon in the office because they always hurt. So, but everybody thinks it's funny. Anyway, okay, let's get back to it. 
comic relief. So um, it, the green Martian test, and it's just, it doesn't work. Lab tests are valuable, very valuable, but, and they become extremely valuable in the hospital because it becomes more and more lab testing and physiology and not what you say. But in the outpatient setting, especially with matters of human health, hormones, it's all about optimal human health. And so you, the doctor needs to do a certain amount of follow-ups with blood tests on your estrogen and progesterone levels. And I'll get to progesterone in another video because that's the toughest hormone to figure out. Um, um, it makes sure you're just not taking away too much. Because women, you can have twice the estrogen level of a 20-year-old female, 400, 500, and you feel fine. You don't feel anything. You know, and I have women who want to be there, but I'm not comfortable with that high. I find no evidence that it does anything. But now with this attitude that, and this is a concerted effort by, by the big universities to prove with their dopey lab studies that no one should be taking estrogen. And so again, I'm sure it's a money thing. They probably have some new drugs that they want to give women in menopause that have nothing to do with menopause, but anyway. So it's really fairly simple. You know, you find a doc that will treat your symptoms and then use then use your symptoms of feeling good to determine the, the amount you take, the frequency, and, and then use blood tests with a doctor. Make sure you're not taking way too much because it's easy to do that. Now, how much do women take on average? Anywhere from daily, but most women take it three to four days a week, estrogen. And so let me tell you about that, and that'll be kind of the last simple thing. I'll do more extensive videos on this with a lot of science, and hopefully videos, little cartoon um, pictures of how this works. Anyway, <clears throat> um, um, so they have topical creams, they have vaginal cream, and they have pills. They have these implants. I don't like those. Don't do the implants. I won't even talk about why. It's just, but, um, but the simplest, most inexpensive way you can do it for five bucks a month cash. You do good RX and buy cash estrogen. You take, you get oral estradiol, and the problem is estrogen gets wiped out by stomach acid and something called first pass elimination by the liver, which I won't explain. And so. We give it to women anyway, and it works, but it's more effective if you just chew up the estrogen tablet with a little sip of coffee or tea, swish it around your mouth for 60 seconds and swallow it, and most of it goes right into your bloodstream, and you bypass all that. The creams are messy. They're a pain in the butt. They have patches. They're a pain in the butt, too, and these are it's so cheap to get the estradiol. And then you just figure out how many days you need it and what the dose is, they have three different doses. And you figure that out by how you feel. And then the doctor makes sure with the blood test. And this works so good. Literally, it's five bucks a month to do estrogen when you do it this way, you know. And other doctors in this field of bioidentical hormones, they have, they want to do certain kinds of estradiol and they want to do mixes, they want to do bioidentical hormones. I'm not against this whole bioidentical hormones, but you'll pay $100 a month to get some mix of estrogen, progesterone, testosterone. And I'll get to that. Most women don't need testosterone. What you need is DHEA. And I will tell you in future videos, maybe I'll, I'll combine that with progesterone. Because men need DHEA too. DHEA is the pro precursor hormone that we make six hormones from, and estrogen, testosterone, along with other hormones, ADH and some other ones. Um, and women, by if you're taking estrogen, you can take DHEA, and the DHEA will preferentially become testosterone, and that's usually all the boost you need. And it is the cat's meow. Those two together is the cat's meow for women um, to have motivation, strength, estrogen effects, mental clarity. So there's ways to do this. There's ways, to, and it's all cost effective. I mean, um, and now, and I'll be getting to it, just as a little teaser, for those of you who know what it means, protein peptide therapies have come a long way. And we are able to now, uh, soon, people will be able to do growth hormone replacement therapy without taking growth hormone. 
but you'll get the same effect. It is this is really great stuff. I I've just been getting into it. I've been away from it for 10 years, and I cannot believe the cost breakdown now. What you can do because growth hormone's always been the tough one, but growth hormone will extend your life. It extends everyone's life. It's great for us, but again, not knucklehead doses like the weightlifters did. And so anyway, <clears throat> that's pretty much for it for estrogen. Those are guidelines you can use, and you got to see your doctor and make sure he's on board. <clears throat> but just to finally say this, there is no scientific studies that have been done correctly to show a relationship between postmenopausal estrogen therapies and breast cancer. I doubt, I don't know if the treatment side means anything. I have a feeling it's not a good idea to get neutered and take those drugs that wipe out your estrogen. Because like 50% of cancers, they're given these drugs, estrogen blockers, testosterone blockers. Um, but we'll see. I'll do a video just on that. I will do an exhaustive search of the literature to see if there's any scientific evidence really to support that. But again, cash cow for the drug companies. We like that movie. That's what they're doing. Money, money, money on these drugs that neuter you. So that's it. I'm Dr. Debunk. Uh, I hope a drug company rep is watching. You can hate me all you want. That's it.